Welcome to From the VC's Bookshelf, a podcast from TBR, the College System of Tennessee, the state's largest higher education system. In this series, we examine how we might re envision the work we do and how we work together as we move into a post pandemic world. Please join our host, Dr. Heidi Lemming, Vice Chancellor for Student Success, as she leads a live discussion with industry experts and leaders throughout our system. In our fall 2023 podcast series, we are leaning into themes found in Atomic Habits by author James Clear. The TBR System Office has been engaged in testing out mindset interventions with students in gateway courses for about seven years now. While Atomic Habits doesn't specifically use the word mindset, the book touches on similar themes. So our series has been drawing connections between the two bodies of work and also highlights how our research partners faculty, and staff are working to change student habits and mindsets in support of academic success and college completion. In today's podcast, I'm excited to be talking to Katherine Hebert Brumley from Dyersburg State Community College. Katherine is a math instructor at Dyersburg State who started as a non-traditional student. After dropping out of college, Katherine joined the Marines as a jet engine mechanic for several years and then was a stay-at-home mom before eventually returning to college to earn an associate's degree in math and biology, a bachelor's degree in math, and finally a master's degree in math. Catherine has taught learning support math courses through pre-calculus and trigonometry, and she served as the Dyersburg State Site Coordinator for the Tennessee Value Project Mindset Work. Welcome, Catherine. Hello. I'm excited to have (laughs) you here today. Thank you. So to start with, um, I always, you know, give a nice little high summary of your background experience, but I want to give you an opportunity to share a little bit more about yourself with our listeners. All right. So, um, yeah, college was kind of a afterthought um, after I joined the Marine Corps, but I had signed up for the GI Bill. And one day we were visiting over Christmas break. My uh, ex-husband and his best friends and I were talking about the GI Bill. And I decided I'd walk into Crowder College in Neosho, Missouri, and uh, ask them, how do I use the GI Bill? And I came back out to the car. My ex was like, what are you doing? I said, I'm grabbing my checkbook to pay my entry fee. And went in, paid my uh, $25 entry fee, and was signed up for college. And that got everything started so I could use my GI Bill. Yeah. Um, I originally started out general studies. I wasn't sure what I was going to do, and but I was leaning towards forensic science. And to avoid the uh, A&P course, the biology A&P course, anatomy and physiology class, I took the calc series and fell in love with math and continued on with math after that. Okay, so you kind of just fell into your interests. You didn't I, I did, I did. Um, I had some wonderful math teachers at Crowder College, and I was like, that's what I want to do. Um, I really was very comfortable with the community college level because of the age limits. It, it wasn't just high school students. I was actually closer to the average age, and I was about 38 when I started. Yeah. And I was just a little bit above the mean, which was 35. And I'm like, oh, I'm actually closer to what the average age is at college, not a bunch of high school kids. And that was one of my big anxieties going to college. I was just like, Oh, they're going to make fun of me because I'm so old. (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, that's going to be great for us to talk about this mindset work today with your particular lens coming in as a non-traditional student, now working with students as well. I'm sure that you've given them lots of advice from your own experience and connections. So that'll be really great for us to dive into that today a little bit more. And your veteran experience being in the military and coming out and um, pursuing a different line of work, right? Totally different line of work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a, lot of stu- a lot of folks are in that boat. So that'll be great for our listeners to hear that today. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the book um, to just get us started. Atomic Habits um, talks about how we create good habits and break bad habits. Um, so for a good habit, we have to make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, make it satisfying. And of course, the inverse is true for ba- breaking a bad habit, right? So as you think about habits, goals, and mindsets, both for your life um, and more broadly for like the learning context, right? Do you think that that's a model that 
that will work? I do believe it is a model that will work. Uh, without reading the book, I've actually done some of those changes in my own personal life to get those kind of habits started. Um, I probably did it when I was working on my college degree, uh, being a non-traditional student, still having to work somewhere and, you know, balance children and work and college all together, mm -hmm. uh, having to set some habits for studying. But um, more recently, I had to start a exercise program. Uh, my health was dictating that I need to do something drastic and make a change in my life. So uh, I decided to dedicate myself to walking every day. And I know some days I can't get outside and walk. If the weather's bad, you're not gonna make it outside. But my goal is five, five to seven days. If I make seven days, that's great. Um, my motivator was getting my dog out there with me because she needs to exercise too. So we, we've started a routine and um, I have an app that I listen to um, where when I hit play on that app, the dog gets excited because she knows, oh, it's time to go walk because that song has started and it's time to start walking. Yeah. So, and we've started this habit and we walk 30 minutes to an hour every single day now. And it's become a very good habit for us. And I knew as it was coming back into winter, I was going to need warm clothes. So that's helped too, getting some warm clothes to wear. <laughs> yeah, right. Setting yourself up for success. So, and I, I tried to instill with my students the importance of getting a study habit. Because a lot of them that I do have are, are um, not, they are traditional students. They're not the non-traditional students. Mm -hmm. And they really never developed that form of study. And so we try to get them to use the math lab you know, two hours in the math lab every week and to go in there and work with the tutors for two hours or if they're in trio, to go in the trio and work with a, a tutor at least two hours every week. My uh, non-traditional students are really good about getting their lab hours in and getting the help they need and setting up a quick habit to study. So, but my younger students, they sometimes kind of trip on that. Yeah. They, they're like, well, I need to work. I need to do this. I they ha they're being pulled in so many directions and they don't understand they need to stop and say, okay, this is my space. I'm going to do this during this space here. Right. So it's interesting, right? Because we talk a lot about how non-traditional students are afraid about coming back and what the workload might be in college. But in a lot of ways, they've learned a lot of things through their life already that are setting them up to be successful as a college student, managing time, having focus. We see this a lot where our non-traditional students actually do much better than our traditional it's rise, right? right. They, they bring that life experience. So talk a little bit about, I mean, you obviously were in that same situation. <laughs> um, what are some things maybe that you kind of impart to your students based on your own experience? I am part on that with them. The biggest thing I push is I said, look, we need to spend two hours outside of it class for every one single hour you're in class. So this is a three hour class, plan on spending six hours outside of class studying. I said, you need to set that up for every single class you're in, not just math, but English, history, whatever class it is. I said, yeah, you're looking at 45 hours probably or more for study time. Make sure you allow yourself that time to study so you don't fall behind. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, are, that we're always really interested in learning more about is, you know, the faculty and what they're doing to engage students in uh, their coursework, particularly math, uh, which is your specialty area. Um, you know, you mentioned in your opening remarks about how you had some faculty who really got you interested in math were really engaging. And that's certainly one piece of this, right, when we talk about mindset. Um, but can you talk a little bit more broadly about the work that you've been leading at Dyersburg State around uh, academic mindset? Uh, yeah, so uh, and it was really nice. Uh, Dyersburg was set up uh, for all of us to go through AQ. And before that, it was uh, Carol Deck's book on mindset. Uh, the faculty member had gone through that before 2020. So this was before I joined them. Yeah. But when I joined, they had set up AQ for all the faculty member to go through AQ. And it was a... Uh, two-year program so I was able to complete the full two-year program and that was a wonderful way to really get focused on uh, not only on mindset but different things you could try in the classroom to try to motivate students to learn yeah and for our listeners 
AQ is a professional association. We have lots of acronyms in higher ed. So for our average listener, I want to make sure they know. So AQ is a professional association, a professional learning opportunity for faculty. Many of our institutions have sent faculty through that program. It's a very intensive program where you have to kind of learn how to redesign your courses to use these best practices in teaching. Um, so I just want to make sure our listeners know what you're referring to. <laughs> I'm glad I did. I've forgotten about that. Yeah, yeah, Dyersburg has definitely invested in that with their faculty. Go ahead and, and okay. tell us a little bit more about the work at Dyersburg. Um, so but that was a good way to get the mindset going. And then for the math department specifically, um, we started these math labs. Um, it started out the math labs were sp- focused around our statistics program for the students where they had to spend two hours in the lab. And I believe it started out originally, if they got below a C, they had to spend two hours. I heard about the math lab and I said, no, all my students are gonna spend two hours a week in the lab. I, a students, F students are all gonna all do that. Uh, and that get, really helps the students realize that we're on their side and it helps them um, if they get active, active with the uh, math lab, they start forming the math communities. I was kind of sad my statistics group really didn't start forming that community until this past week. I'm like right before finals. <laughs> um, but they were in there all week this week studying together. They took over two tables studying and talking to each other and going back and forth. I was like, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I, I want to see y'all do. Uh, but I had one semester where I had one class that was Zoom and one class that was in person. And they started meeting on my Zoom lab hours because I do set up lab hours for Zoom um, specifically for my non-traditional students. Uh, they can't always come into the lab during the day when the lab is open. And they started meeting on my Zoom lab and they formed a group and they would go into breakout groups and study together in my Zoom lab. And then they started meeting together and most of them were going on into nursing and they continue to keep their study groups through the nursing program. And I'd see them out in the trio studying together and seeing them working together. And that's, I think that's what the whole idea is with, you know, doing the math lab, doing group work is getting them to build those communities where they become a learning community, not just a math community or English community. They're now a learning community and they're learning all the way through together. Right, right. Yeah, and that's a great point. So one of the things, you know, we've always considered our mindset work to be part of our high impact practice work as well. And one of the high impact practices is learning communities where groups of students are taking courses together as like a cohort model. Um, But they're doing things outside the classroom, too, to engage, whether it's study groups like what you're talking about, you know, things where they're building that sense of community. And the research shows they do much better academically when they have those connections. They do. Yes. So (laughs) that's great because that's that's exactly what you're wanting, whether you intended for the literary community to happen or not. Just through your course setup, it it did happen. I think my big goal originally was. Um, I discovered while I was still working as an adjunct at Crowder College that when people work together in groups, they learn more and they do better in class. And so I was bringing that experience into my classes since having them work together so they can learn better. Uh, And then I started learning about learning communities. I'm like, wait, I did that. (laughs) Yeah, right. And I was, I really like how well it does work. Um, the students who kind of are like, oh, kind of introverted. It's really hard to get them involved in them, but I still tried to pull them in mm-hmm. and try to get them to participate. And some of them do open up and start participating. Yeah. Well, one of the features of the book is also talking about how we set up our systems uh, and change our systems to support good habits. So whether it's a faculty member who designs a course to encourage them to do these activities and changing the system or literally the system, TBR, uh, you know, really working with our institutions to bring these best practices into the classroom, high impact practices, mindset principles. Um, I guess, I, you know, I'm curious to hear. So how have you all seen that play out at Dyersburg State in terms of the mindset work and how you're uh, moving that into your math curriculum? Well, the bigger one has been, again, the math lab that we talked about. Our math labs are located just outside the math classrooms, and our offices are also really close to the uh, math lab. 
So our students end up walking, they're walking past that math lab every day. They're seeing a lot of the faculty members in the math lab. Um, I spend quite a bit of time in the math lab just to be there, to be a presence, to help. Uh, my trick students do not have a math tutor, so I'm kind of the only one that's there to help with the tricks. So if they come in and say, I'm really struggling with this problem, I can sit down and work with them and they don't have to be afraid of not being able to get it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, so the location of the, our math lab has been very big in supporting that. And I also had some other notes on that. So I'm gonna quickly turn to the, my notes about what we've been doing on this. Yeah, so we have our math labs and then I start doing the group works and having them work together in groups. And that's been another thing that's been really helpful for them. And then um, I, my uh, coordinator had talked about what she did is she starts her class talking about math anxiety. I usually end up bringing it up, I think probably the second or third semester because I start noticing students are kind of drifting away and I'm like, okay, let's talk about this. What 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 are you struggling with? What are you frightened about? And what is the problem? And let's focus on this issue right now and let's get, get this under control before we go any further. Right. But all of us have done different things like that. Yeah. To work on it. Well, yeah, I mean, clearly there's a lot of students who have come into a math course feeling like they maybe will get it, right, or be successful. So, I mean, you have those those students who come in kind of with that notion that they can't do math. Um, most of them come in with the attitude is, I hate math, I'm not good at it, mm -hmm. I've never been good at it. Um, and my goal, personally, is to change that attitude. I want them to leave with, okay, I can do math, I actually enjoyed math. I've actually had my first comment from a student this semester. I'm enjoying this class. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, I win. <laughs> but I want them to realize it's not a scary club course. You know, you hear the horror stories of the different courses. I My trick class is terrified of taking calculus next semester. And we had a meeting this week on that. Um, I sat down with them. I said, okay. Who in here is afraid of taking calculus is thinking about not taking it? I'm, over half the hands went up. I said, okay, you tell me why. And I just pointed to students and said, tell me why. And then pointed to another student. And a lot of them were afraid because I'm not teaching it. Uh, this is a middle college group. It's one of our new projects at Dyersburg. And they've had me for the th last three math semesters they've had. And I'm not teaching this calculus series. I said, you know, our other teacher, he's just as informed. I said, we both teach very similarly. We have things, and they were also concerned because he's not going to be um, using our math platform that we typically use for most of our math classes. I said, well, that platform actually doesn't offer a calculus series. I said, he had to change the, the platform that he's using because it's not offered. I said, I don't think it's something to be afraid of. He talked about it and he said it's actually easier to use than the one we're using right now. I think you will enjoy this course. Yeah. And he's, I said, and I will be around. I'll be in the math lab. So if you need tutoring, come find me because I can do calculus. Yeah. And so I can help at least with tutoring with that too. So, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's just kind of being transparent with the students about what's going to happen next and kind of easing their fears, assuring them that you're not leaving them on their own yeah You're, there's gonna be some continuity there and there's some fear of the unknown i mean we all experience that no matter whether it's having a new child or getting married or anything like that there's there's an unknown apps aspect and that unknown aspect is a little scary mm -hmm. right well you know one of the things that um we also are, are really interested in is just uh, opinions that educators have about just how we design our, our environments for success you you did a really great example already about where the offices of the faculty are located close to the lab so students are seeing you all in the lab frequently or walking by your offices on their way there um that's kind of reinforcing visually uh, but just by creating a space where students, you know, are, are seeing what they need to do. I'm, I'm just kind of curious, you know, what are some other kind of environmental design things that you all have thought about? Um, you know, there's lots of conversation right now about the use of technology in teaching and how that might change um, the environment for students. In your opinion, what are what are some things for, for educators to be thinking about? Um, as far as technology, 
<clears throat> with the math class, a lot of us have kind of a ne negative view towards the technology. Yes, calculators are wonderful, but when I need have a student pulling out a calculator to do one times zero, I'm like, you should be able to do that without the calculator. Yeah. That should be, you know. I think with a lot of students that get too dependent on that technology, uh, especially like with the AI or like math apps. Um, <clears throat> and I've had in the past where students have used the math, like the photo app, photo math, take a picture of the equation and they get an answer. If they went through and actually wrote down the steps on paper of how the problem was worked in the math app, before they wrote down their answer where they learned how to do it, that'd be one thing. But most of the time, their students are looking for an easy way out. So what's the easiest way to get to the solution? They're not thinking about, oh, I need to think about how to get to the solution. And I think that's a big problem with technology. We can actually go too far in the wrong direction mm -hmm. with technology. Um, for me personally, one of the things I would like to do is um, I want to actually apply for a grant to actually have my classroom remodeled where we have round tables where they sit together in groups um, because just the long straight tables don't really do well with group work um, and it makes the group work really difficult, hard to talk to each other. Right. And then I want to have dry erase boards put up more so students can actually go up and physically work at a board. Uh, I know that's more of old school, but that old schoolness sometimes is the best way to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, you know, one of the things that, again, I think is, is interesting is it's reinforcing that idea of collaboration and group learning, which, again, you know, you really valued in, in the work that you've done with students so far. So even designing the space to foster that, right? Um, so when we think about kind of the more salient themes from the book, um, you know, we're thinking about, again, mindset and how we change habits. Um, what are the key takeaways that you think, you know, from your experience, you would want either a non-traditional student or a traditional student to take into consideration? Or habits for studying. Um, honestly, watch the cell phone usage. Um, I've had students buying stuff on eBay during class. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remind students to put cell phones away, but you see them out. They're like this, texting, or maybe they're more blatant and <laughs> very physical. You know, they're on their phones too much. Um, and I know we need to have the cell phones, especially now with the two-factor authorization. We have to go through. It's kind of a two-edged sword. You know, we need it. It's a good work tool, but at the same time, I think setting a habit where you put it away, mm -hmm. where you turn it upside down, where you turn off the ringer, um, where you walk away from the technology um, or walk away from those things that tempt you towards not studying. Yeah. And I think we all had those habits where we have to be careful, even for our own personal selves that, you know, we have priorities we need to take care of, you know, kids, pets, whatever it is that you need to take care of. And so this, the screen time is really, I'm going to say a bad habit <laughs> and very detrimental to studying and to schoolwork. And I try to remind my students to put the phones away. Yeah, be present. Really, be present. being present in the moment. And I think that's a great life skill, just even at beyond the, the math course, right? It's like uh, how we uh, just learn how to be critical thinkers. Like you were saying, instead of just looking for the answer, how the problem is actually solved is in the long term, you know, going to help you identify how you solve other problems too, right? If you know the steps. Right. And not every problem that you're solving is always going to be a math problem. Um, I think the most infamous statement most math professors hear, if not all of them, is when will I ever use this in real life? They may not use that, you know, they may not use sine and cosine in their everyday life. But how they get a solution to a daily problem, they will be using every single day of their life. And I, you know, people have to always are telling me, you're really good. You came up with a great solution. That was a great idea. 
I just do it naturally because I've been doing it for so long. Mm. You know, always have to solve the problem, always have to figure out what the next step is. And when you get into that habit, um, it does become easier to solve problems. And a lot of job skills require being able to be a problem solver, not necessarily a math problem solver, but just a problem solver. And I feel that math really helps build those critical skills to solving problems. Right. Great. Well, that's a good way to end the conversation today because, again, we're trying to make the connection between what students or prospective students might come into our institutions to experience and the ways that we're engaging them for the ultimate goal of going out into the workforce and applying these skills, like we just talked about, good habits uh, in the workplace. So thank you again, Catherine, for coming in today and, and talking with me. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for listening to this edition of From the VC's Bookshelf, brought to you by TBR, the College System of Tennessee, powering the state's economy and changing the lives of thousands of graduates starting successful careers each year. To learn more about upcoming book selections or to register to attend discussions live, visit tbr.edu bookshelf.